Hi, and welcome to another exciting webinar organized by the Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies. My name is Dimitri Lilkov, and I'll be moderating today's panel. The year 2020 has already been crazy enough in the world of politics, business, and health. But the European Commission wants to keep us busy even before the holidays with the announcement of the new Digital Markets Act and the proposal for a new approach towards competition law and rules for online platforms. The legislative proposal is still in the making. Um, we expect to see it in December 2020. And there'll be a long time before a final decision is, taking, is taken. But why has the Commission decided to go so big on this file? Well, the Commission is going big because it sees a growing problem with big tech companies, not only about privacy and disinformation, but also about competition policy and the allegations that some of these companies are behaving like monopolists in the online world. This year, the European Commission opened investigations against Apple and Amazon for potentially abusing their dominant position in the online environment. We've also heard of the long-standing and big cases against Google for their potential uh, unlawful practices in search and also advertisement. Facebook and Microsoft haven't been spared as well throughout the years when it comes to the European Commission's competition policy. But even though these competition cases make the headlines and impose big fines, there is much uncertainty in debate whether they actually improve competition in the online world. This is why the European Commission wants to boost and upgrade its competition rules with Digital Markets Act so that this damage does not occur. Of course, there is much debate about the actual design of the Digital Markets Act and all of these rules which are yet to come. This is an extremely complex topic, so I really hope that today's set of speakers and set of professionals will shine a bit more light on the Digital Markets Act and its design. I'm really happy that today we are joined by, first of all, Deirdre Kloon, member of the European Parliament from the, from the EPP. He is currently part of the Committee on Internal Market and Consumer Protection in the Parliament. Ms. Kloon has extensive political experience on the national and local level in Ireland. We're also joined by Hosuk Lee Makiyama. He is the director of ESIPE, the European Center for International Political Economy. Hosuk is also a fellow at the Department for International Relations at the London School of Economics. And lastly, we are joined by Elin Chivo. She's a senior policy analyst at the Center for Data Innovation, focusing on technological policy. Elin's professional resume also features working for a trade association in Brussels, as well as a think tank in the Netherlands. A couple of uh, house rules before we, we begin. Uh, we will try to keep this debate open and understandable for a non-technical audience. Um, if some of you viewers uh, and guests have any questions to our panelists, shoot them on Twitter or send them in the live Facebook feed below. We will address uh, Q&A from the audience in the last 15 minutes of our session. So let's kick off this debate. MEP uh, Kloon, how is the debate unfolding in the European Parliament and why is this topic so important for European consumers and internet users? M microphone, please. Fatal mistake number one, it happens all the time. No, I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to contribute and uh, to this debate, which I suppose we are, well, it's somewhat in the dark because we don't have the proposals in the Commission yet, although we have many, many, um, uh, well, she's spoken herself and there's many assessments of what will be in the legislation. At the outset, um, it, it's, it's important because good competition policy and enforcement uh, best serves the needs of the consumer and I suppose the economy as a whole as well. And I think we need to keep that to the fore. This is about serving the consumer. Uh, and with that, you have to support and ensure that there is a place for small businesses and big businesses as well to give choice. Um, and I would, I'd like to say that just, just because um, something is big or a company is big, a large, a dominant, it doesn't mean that it's, it's, um, it's, it's illegal. Uh, and we shouldn't just seem to uh, attack companies just because they are big or dominant, but, but the but what would be illegal is they were abusing that dominant position, and I think that needs to be at the core of this of this debate and this dis and the discussion that we're going to have with the Digital Markets Act. So uh, you asked me about the Parliament, 
and the positions there at the moment, well, the Parliament, um, end of October last month, uh, had finalised in plenary a report, or their initial report on the approach to the Digital Service Act. The Digital Mar Market Act wasn't uh, really uh, analysed at that point, but there we have looked in our in our report at a number of areas that we would like to see addressed um, in terms of competition and um, mani potential manipulation or abuse of, of dominant positions. Basically, at, at the heart of it is to ensure that the single market continues uh, to operate as, as it does successfully since its inception, since the, in, um, uh, the development of the e-commerce directive 20 years ago now has been good for small businesses across Europe, allowing them to operate across borders. And in turn, that's Good for good, good, good for consumers as well as well as national economies and European economies. So one of the points in the committee's reports, we believe that the an ex ante mechanism should apply uh, when competition law is 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 not sufficient to address market failures, and um, that would mean that at this point you would address or you would identify practices and procedures that are that would be deemed to be illegal and anti competitive. Um, that we want to legislate any legislative measures produced to be evidence based uh, through in, in impact assessment and based on factual implications um, and based on relevant data and statistics. And I think this is very important if we are going to move forward in the area because it is a big question and we need, it needs to be evidence based. And, 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 you know, we need to define what is exactly a systemic operator and it must be on the basis of clear indicators. So these were form part of the Parliament's position uh, that we had adopted. And I said that it should be a closed list of, uh, not, not necessarily a closed list of, 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 a closed list, sorry, of positive and negative actions uh, should be in, in place. Um, we uh, are, are really concerned, uh, looking forward to the Commission's proposal as well, because we believe that, um, uh, it, as I say, it should be based on, on um on evidence, and we'll be looking. Look, we'll be looking forward to that. However, um, uh, we set up, um, and however, we recognise that you know that that just because, as I say, a company is big doesn't mean that it should should it, that it contributes to market failure or is negative for the consumer because the consumer out, out actually does benefit from uh, supply of services. And just because a company is large, um, should shouldn't be. Uh, we need to take that into consideration that it can be good for consumers. It's also a platform for small businesses uh, across Europe to um, to operate. But in in time, times when we see we see evidence or if we hear evidence of, of stories where um, data is being used or abused, preventing data to be shared with business operators on the platform, uh, we saw in the Commission's uh, statement last week when they uh, opened their case against. Amazon concerned about data not being shared across the platform and uh, using using data that they do have uh, to uh, introduce or to work against uh, would-be competitors that are using their platform. So I think all these areas uh, we need to examine, we need to tread, tread carefully, but at, at the centre and at the core of all our deliberations and discussions, particularly when we're dealing with the, with the Digital Market Act will be to ensure that competition is allowed to flourish, that small businesses, large businesses and micro businesses as well are allowed uh, to, to operate in a fair manner uh, because ultimately that's good for consumer. Any uh, competition essay that you read or, uh, put, uh, or discussion that you hear mm. always says that, that competition is, is the basis for consumers and we've seen it in many areas how competition really benefits consumers so that's I think what I would say about the parliament's position is we'll be, open, we'll be approaching this in a hope to be a fair even manner but at this, at, at ultimately delivering what will be a, a, a fair uh, market for consumers and those businesses that serve those consumers. Fantastic. Thank Fantastic thank you for this this opening just to quickly jump in um, Deidre mentioned uh, ex ante rules, just for our audience to uh, to highlight that ex ante rules, these are rules which are set up and have to be enforced before a market failure occurs. And this is one of the goals of, of, of this proposal. Uh, and also there was a great introduction about uh, potentially abuse, abuse of, of dominance of position, abuse of data. 
and maybe the commission is hinting that it will provide us with a list of uh, do's and do nots um, for, for digital companies. Eileen, you want to jump on, on this? Microphone, please. That's a classic. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Dimitar, uh, for this invitation. Thanks to the Martin Center. And um, yeah, thank you uh, to uh, MEP uh, Kroenert uh, for, uh, for the points that uh, she made. Uh, yeah, definitely happy to jump in. Um, first, uh, just a quick remark that it's almost gone unnoticed, but the Regulatory Scrutiny Board has raised concerns about the DMA in its opinion a few days ago. Uh, so we're looking at a timetable here that is very challenging and, and maybe rushing things wouldn't be reasonable, especially considering that the analysis required should be uh, sophisticated and it's not, which is quite disconcerting. Um, one issue at, at heart of the DMA proposal is that because the problems associated with online platforms and the online economy are hard and global, we tend to look for easier, convenient answers um, and are going for solutions that everyone understand. We understand what it means if they break them up. Uh, it's clear and easy and that was done before with Standard Oil or at and in the US. The problem is that the Commission has to address it. How do you react quickly to so many things that you consider being issues, yet have due process? And there's a lot of political pressure for regulators to act and make B2B fairness laws, and, and the DMA is part of this broader uh, movement. Um, the problem is that those solutions we're seeing here aren't um, adequate to solve the hard problem, the problem that uh, we're identifying. And it's, it's likely that the um, intended effect if it's the dismantled platforms and their market share won't solve the alleged problems that they're seeking to cause. Um, another problem is that policymakers are trying to define the entirety of the tech industry as being covered by one standard um, set of rules and to deal with things ranging from how Amazon deals and treats its suppliers, how Apple Store works, and, and what Google uh, can add to, to, to search. But this would be similar to saying, we will create rules to cover how supermarkets manage their, their supply chain, how banks deal with their mortgage brokers, and how TV stations handle production companies, just because they're all a supply chain buying things from producers and distributing that. But we can't have one set of regulation for all that, right? So really the main thing is that we need to ask ourselves, what problem is it that we're trying to solve and what is the goal? And we need to ask that question first. Fairness, is it competition, consumer welfare, and if so, if there's evidence of consumer harm, how, how broad of a scope um, do we want to go for? How many difficult issues do we want to address at the same time? And defining the scope is, is important, not least because um, the consequence of what's happening in, in the debate is that we'd be aiming at changing market shares, right? So digital markets are a big market which would lack competition. So we're going to change the market to create competition. But disrupting a market, that isn't trivial. Uh, and regulations typically that will target digital players, uh, be it big digital players, will inevitably impact the entire uh, ecosystem, SMEs and consumers. One issue also is about regulatory coherence and overlap. For instance, where is the evidence that there needs to be a second regulatory intervention before having evaluating the, evaluated the effects of the, the platform to business regulation that just came into force in July? Um, now, the EU competition policy is actually well suited to tackle the situations that the Commission is looking at because it can address um, uh, anti-competitive behaviors of companies that have different business models. Of course, though, that will require some modernization because what we should avoid um, is to use competition and antitrust to assess digital markets the way we assess competition on other markets. Like, for instance, using the number of competitors as the criterion that's the wrong approach because many digital markets tend towards concentration because of network effect. That can actually drive efficient outcomes for all, be pro-innovation and pro-consumer because a lot of those uh, services remain free to, to consumers. Um, now, what the alleged issues and obligations or prohibited practices, what they stem from uh, is an old view, a narrow perspective of digital markets and a misunderstanding of how um, digital business models work and how, how um, uh, competition operates on digital market. Uh, just a few examples, you know, we have the reference to gatekeepers as a, a handful of platforms, like it, a oh, suspicious term to use, but, but like it's one species. But there are many different types of such platforms, but not just four or five, but more than that. And they have diverse uh, business models, which makes it 
difficult to talk about one single category. And if you have some practices that are prohibited, they might not apply the same way to all of them. Another example is when we talk about self preferencing, bundling and um, tying practices, integrating different activities uh, within one platform doesn't necessarily have a negative effect. Sometimes it can actually increase the capacity of online platforms to deliver uh, diversity of, of services to their business users, like app developers, or even for them to compete with each other. Uh, and self-preferencing depends on the context. It can drive many businesses to innovate and to stand out from others. And there are also benefits for users. Many startups, just to add, have succeeded because of the free or low cost that, um, services that these platforms can provide. So it's like this type of personalized ad model that allows Facebook to provide apps or tools for free and level the playing field for businesses. And the current cost for startups to start a business in the current ecosystem is quite low. And so here, the message that policymakers would be sending is we're disincentivizing you to grow, we're discouraging you to scale up because this is what may happen if you grow too much and go beyond a certain threshold. Uh, so how do you grow bigger companies in Europe when you have that as, as a mindset? And also, um, with respect to data-related measures, another example, if the problem is the amount of data that a platform holds and an, you know, an instrument of market power, what is it that you mean with data? Also, let's not forget data sharing and uh, interoperability of data are complex issues. There are issues of uh, uh, IP, data protection, privacy, uh, security, and interoperability standards um, de demands. Um, are, yeah, these, this is not straightforward for all. So just to finish on this, um, uh, the regulation, I think, should be targeted at measures that, you know, prevent innovation and like to, to avoid innovation and, and, and enable better access to the market, not targeting measures that companies that are big or from the US or have whatever background or are in a particular sector. And finally, maybe rather than applying the precautionary principle even to antitrust, we should focus on um, incentivizing a climate of entrepreneurship in Europe, embrace innovation, strengthen the single market, um, reduce the fragmentation uh, and not adding red tape and maybe case by case assessments uh, guided with basic principles of, of competition policy and targeted remedies with codes of conduct and you know when all players can participate in their respective markets like participative antitrust would be a better direction um, thank you very much for uh, yeah, your attention let me let me thank you very much for this this opening. I, I just want to quickly uh, follow up on your on your remarks. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned that the Commission and the European Union already has the competition tools and the antitrust provisions which it can it can employ um, in, in these investigations. But however, we've seen them applied throughout the last decade. We've seen big fines, but these investigations also take a long time to finish. By the time one investigation is finished, another one is open. Um, there's much concern that these competition rules, they were written in times when we used pagers and fax machines. Don't you think that this comprehensive upgrade is actually timely and we, the digital environment has changed? Yes, but if you have, uh, say, extended measures, uh, that will also take a significant amount of time and it will be quite difficult to find evidence of consumer harm before a particular service is launched. So. I think we will be solving the delay issue with these measures. Okay, Halsuk, what's what's your take on this? Guide us through the complexities of the market act. Thank you, Dimitar. Uh, I'll perhaps start with what I don't think the issue is. What's not my take? You ask for my take, and I'm going to tell you what my non-take is. Uh, I don't think it's a question of whether, whether we need regulation or not, because I think, at least to my knowledge, no one here on this panel is an anarchist. Uh, I hope no one in this audience is. I think we all recognize that we need regulation. Why do we need regulation? Because we need to avoid market failures and abuse. And I recognize that abuse happens in all sectors, including digital. Uh, we can have different ideas about how we address them, but I can tell you what the European way is, which is that we try to do them horizontally rather than by product by product. If you go into a supermarket, 
you don't find a product liability law or consumer protection law for canned beans versus detergent versus etc cetera, etc cetera. you do them pretty categorically and horizontally why because we believe that everything and everyone um, should have equal treatment and that's who we are that's what actually make us europeans so and also it's pretty practical it doesn't make sense to have 4000 different product laws i am entitled to be protected against white beans and brown beans if there is um if they are not fit for eating and in a sense you could very well argue that in you know, digital products as well as offline well digital services and uh, on offline traditional retail services should have equal obligations and this is a, something of a bit of a debate i guess and i'll come back to the point but my main point is exactly where elin and your discussion with mitar and the, which is about when do we address these market failures and we have now basically two schools with ex ante where we standardize certain practices and policies to solve very very specific problems with very predetermined outcomes i call them predetermined because actually it's written in law how each problem should be solved if you provide a certain type of service you cannot do certain things regardless of whether you're small you're big you're left-handed right-handed if you're american or if you're domestic or if you're belgian it doesn't matter this is the nature of ex ante rules at least if you're non-discriminatory and in other words we have a pretty much predefined formula on how we are going to solve the problems and that is not really uh, perhaps the most efficient way to uh, solve problems first of all regulators tend to be you know they have cognitive and confirmation bias and this approach is highly prone to manipulation by lobbyists and vested interest groups who have a very strong political influence rather than consumer interest there's a very interesting writing on ex ante regulation by OECD that says that you have to basically do them on a very few limited cases for example when you have an unbearable cost of failure like death that's why buildings have building codes ex ante there are certain materials you just can't use and in certain profession you have qualifications doctors and some of them are even licensed and these are basically high risk activities that justify singling them down out can we say honestly just because a service whether we are talking about travel booking or whether we're talking about retail or whatever whatever it is searching for stuff whatever you're looking for online is that a high risk service with an unbearable cost of failure i'm just quick put the question out there so in other words there is a very high cost in going to ex ante rather than ex post which is what we how we europeans normally do things we address the problem once it has taken place once there is a cost that has been established and with, once it's a, it's a fait accompli and also the information is available when there is sufficient evidence that we can't actually allow certain things to happen because as you were saying Dimitar the over and over again because you're dominant and this is how competition rules works and but the problem with ex ante is basically that it creates or actually not just ex ante all kind of regulation the number one reason why we are actually uh, actually number two reason why we are uh, imposing regulation is simply because well uh, aside from avoiding death being number one there are also unacceptable moral distribution of income so if we benefit one particular type of companies germans versus french or one kind of industry or sector against another we would basically step off and say hey this distribution you are unfairly advantaged and we cannot actually have this this is one of the main reason we have competition policy now i'm clearly of the view that all problems more or less can be solved ex post when it comes to simple things as non critical services like information service which song i listen to on spotify is not going to kill anyone except a few brain cells of mine if i listen to bad music which i very often do 
But in short, the unacceptable distribution of income is really just a question about offline to online or sometimes European to foreign. If that's the object that we are trying to address, we should be very honest about it and say that the reason we are doing Exante is because we are actually lagging behind in digitalization. Digital is not the European way of doing things, and therefore we are going to impose certain restrictions. Because it was, if it was size and the domain was the problem, we would still be using competition tools. If the problem was the fact that we have we create information dissymmetries and diversity of opinions, etc., there are media laws to address these kind of problems. We will be taking a completely different approach rather than saying, let's skim off the, the biggest 20 or 30 companies in the digital platform sector. It just doesn't make any sense. So basically, um, what I wanted to conclude this uh, very uh, short intervention is uh, ex ante fits very poorly for the very dynamic and productivity driven industry like information services, especially for EU, because the legislative framework that we are dealing with is not just accustomed to these kind of rapid updates that we, we need to have. We may have a one definition of what a platform is today. And in just in two years, you know, uh, the big tech companies that we are talking about could be actually out of business. I mean, if you think about it, look at the, all the remedies we asked from Microsoft because we thought Microsoft was invincible. That was just 10 years ago. And since then, you know, we have seen Apple, Google, and Amazon, all these companies come in and go, Spotify dethroned Apple, which in turn dethroned Microsoft from the music business. And the key reason why we actually went after Microsoft just a few years ago was because we thought that the Microsoft's dominance was permanent that they will basically take over the music industry. That obviously didn't happen. And if you don't believe me, I have a Microsoft Zoom player in my drawer that I would like to sell to you. And so uh, to sum it up, there's going to be a major economic cost because basically uh, what we are going to be assuming is that everyone is in the digital platform space is going to cause a market failure. Now, if you assume that every online platform is as bad as, let's say, Google or Amazon or Facebook, and you're going to impose that restriction on everyone who is a platform, then that is going to have a major cost. And we can actually estimate that cost because we have very good input and output tables on how each industry uses different kinds of services. And we can also measure from past mistakes we've done when we've gone from ex post to ex ante, for example, in the telecom industry. And if you impose those productivity losses on the digital platform market, we can see that we are looking at somewhere, it's not going to sound very impressive, but it's about a half percent of GDP, assuming that those rules are actually applied. My guess is that they won't be in the same way that we can't enforce GDPR on everyone, every small shop and every Excel sheet that you have on your computer with the, all the people that you want to send Christmas cards to. If, and if you can't impose them to everyone, that means that the executive needs to be selective. And that's where the danger of discrimination comes in. So what should we be doing instead? I'm just gonna wrap it up. I hear your call and I hear my own personal reflection as well that we need to address dominance. How big is the e-commerce market in Europe? It's 16%, even during the pandemic, uh, in, in the middle of the pandemic, only 16% of the retail purchases happening through digital channels. If you think the big online platforms are dominant, what do you think Dell Hayes and Carrefour is? I agree that it is morally wrong to say that if you promote your own products on, for example, to take Amazon, Amazon has an e-reader, Kindle. If you Google or if you search on Amazon for a Kindle, uh, sorry, an e-reader, if Kindle pops up first, yes, I think it's immoral. But you can go into any supermarket today and you will see Carrefour and Del Hayes promoting their own product right up in the front. 
you have to recognize, at least morally, that this is the same problem. It's not a worse problem because it's digital. And here's where it fails. The main reason we are having discussion in this first place between ex ante and ex post is because the digital platforms are not dominant and we want to basically subject them to competition concessions, even though they are not. And this is where the world is now looking at us and saying, wow, we didn't know that Europeans could do this kind of double speak. And that's where I'm a little bit concerned. I, 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 wanna, I wanna jump in uh, exactly on um, whether they're dominant or not. And, and the question you posed in the beginning about the, the actual harm, the actual harm imposed. Well, here comes a, a counter argument. We're talking about search, we're talking about advertisement, sometimes talking about even news distribution. It's up to 90%, 90% of advertising revenue goes to two companies in, in, in the world. This is one counter argument which, which uh, I addressed to you. And the second one is you mentioned also GDPR and the costs of imposing new rules. I remember the time when people and some industries were saying that GDPR is going to uh, slash off two, three, even 4% of, of uh, European GDP. Uh, but that didn't really happen. And GDPR, maybe it's not the best success story, but it didn't have such a painful and negative effect on the European economy. What do you think? I'll answer to that. First of all, uh, digital marketing accounts for less than half of the media spend. I have a background in advertising. Before I actually went into law and economics, I worked in the advertising industry and, um, well, the coffee in these offices were better than in law firms. So I was in my mid twenties, I'm very superficial. So, but in short, I can assure you that even if you look by the numbers, print TV is still much bigger. And you also have much bigger market concentration in these fields rather than in digital. So in other words, yes, if you look at by distribution, I mean, if you look at one distribution channel, for example, an online advertising platform represent, it may look very dominant if you actually look at that particular segment. But no one is singling out and say that, hey, actually, we have a de facto monopoly, for example, in radio advertising. No one cares about that. I mean, if you narrow it down very close enough, you're going to find dominance. And this is actually one of the problems that the uh, European Commission had in some other cases. So, for example, in order to make a case stick, I believe it was against Android, uh, because you, they couldn't actually prove that Android was dominant. They had to call that Android its own market. Android is, of course, going to have 100% of the, uh, the Android market. And this is the kind of convoluted thinking that we are actually engaged in because the competition policy doesn't really work. So I would refute you on the point that, you know, yeah, yeah, 90% of search goes through the biggest search engine. And this is actually, you're highlighting a very good question, which is that our way of dealing with competition, the tools we have, because they are so legalistic, they're not actually very fit to address not just network effects, but they are, these are temporary monopolies. These doesn't exist in our competition tool vocabulary. Uh, it barely does in actually any jurisdiction because we're struggling with them. Exactly for the case that people in this sector are dominant for maybe five to seven to 10 years, or maybe even shorter. Let's see how long Spotify lasts. But okay, let, me, let, me, let me stop you right there because I don't want, want us to, to dominate the, the discussion. And if you clue, you, you have a comment, I guess. Yeah, I just, just like, like if I comment, I mean, I said, this is the discussion and this is where we're forming opinions. But just on the point of, uh, of, of dominance, um, I think that's really going to be a question that's going to be half identified. Are there do dominant players in the market that do influence competition? And, you know, in the unfair trading practice directive, there are issues there that are if you like blacklisted in terms of an ex ante approach if you want to compare like that so i think you know it has happened before um and and i the, the commission did say in comments recently she was at commissioner investigo was asked about this issue of ex ante and she said because she finds that she cannot deal with it at, at the, with, with she cannot 
prove um, issues. It's very hard to deal with it from a digital point of view and she feels that ex ante would certainly satisfy a lot of concerns there. Uh, and, you know, I think from, from that point of view, I think you were going to see in her legislation, if it comes on the 2nd of December, in C in her proposals, in ex ante provision there. So, um, uh, and regardless of whether whether uh, we think it's it's good or bad at this point. So we'll be looking at it really closely to analyse it, but uh, see what's based on facts, if it, if it stands up. And um, if there are, and to, as I said at the beginning, to identify what are dominant or gatekeepers or sy systemic platforms. I think we need to, to def define that. And um, I've been thinking a lot about this, your, your, anal your anal analogy about the, the supermarkets. And, um, you know, you think of small businesses or small products who can't get themselves on the shelf of the supermarkets, probably similar that they f there, there are dom dominant um, uh, operators in, 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 in grocery, in the grocery, ch in our grocery chain, in the, in the supermarket area. But you, the consumer always has the option to go across the town to another, to a competitor who probably have um, a different range, range of supplies. So there are, we don't have any one dominant supplier in, in the area. There are a range of large suppliers. So I um, think, you know, any, any area we go to, we can see we've learned from competition, we've learned from dominance and how if you keep the consumer the small business at the centre and allow them to have access and to, to flourish. I think that's probably, that would be central um, in all our thinking in this legislation when it comes forward. We've we've fleshed out many 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 uh, issues here. Elin, any any comment on that or on some of these points? Yeah, um, thanks. Um, um, I, I wanted to get back to you first your your remark on the GDPR. Uh, of course, it's. It maybe hasn't been the disaster that uh, stakeholders had expected at the time. Uh, but if you look at some surveys, uh, the trade association Bitcom regularly does those surveys among uh, companies uh, that are members, the biggest German trade association, I think. Uh, and yearly, since the GDPR's implementation, the development before the GDPR came into fourth force, you had, um, I think last year, um, 74% of respondents that mentioned that they thought data protection requirements were the main obstacle to the development of new technologies. And before the GDPR came into force, it was less than half percent, I think 45% in 2017. Uh, also, you, you do, you, you know, you, it has imposed additional costs on, on smaller business. Um, in terms of compliance, uh, you know, you have companies that might have hired lawyers uh, instead of engineers and developers. Um, and I think we've seen, we've published a few things on that, uh, you know, about how, you know, some mergers didn't go through, um, that, um, you know, you had a decrease of venture deals uh, for some uh, startups in Europe. Uh, you had also an impact on re reduced competition in digital advertising. Uh, and. Uh, you know, the resources are limited for data um, protection authority. Uh, they are struggling because you have this deadline of 70 hours reporting, you know, under which companies have to report if they there's a breach or if they suspect there's a breach. And to be on the safe side, because of the potential fines that they would be facing, companies prefer to report, but then you end up having big data protection authorities, including the one with a large budget, like the Dutch one or the French one, complaining that they just can't handle everything. So um, I think this is, if you want to have a, a law or, or something, you want to regulate something, it's important to make sure you have the appropriate resources and skills to deal with that. And with the DMA, we might run into a similar issue that, you know, you don't have all these people necessarily right now at GCOM or in other authorities that couldn't make it, you know, to enforce a little properly. Uh, to get back on the, the issue of dominance, um, yeah, it's an interesting um, example I've, I've, I wanted to add something about, for, if you take the example of Instagram and YouTube, so Instagram is big, YouTube is big, but one could argue that it's not because they belong to Facebook or Google respectively. They have, in the end, their own market strength and their brand image. So it's quite distinct from Facebook and Google, at least to consumers. So they're part of, say, a conglomerate, but they aren't bundled. So it's more like a natural monopoly, if you will talk about monopoly. So breaking up or disintegrating wouldn't necessarily have the intended effect. Um, 
and also let's say TikTok. Um, TikTok is like YouTube, but not quite. It's that other thing. Does TikTok worry about YouTube? Well, it's it's that other thing. So how can we apply antitrust theory to to this? What are we worrying about? Uh, think of IBM. They, they don't have competition in mainframes, for instance. No one worries about that. Uh, so, uh, and, and then another thing that uh, Hosek and, and MEP Kuhn addressed uh, is that, you know, market definition. Do, does Amazon have 40% um, market share or 10%? Does Apple have 15% or 80%? Uh, does Google worry more about Bing or, or TikTok? And it depends. It's, it's complicated, uh, yet it's a b basic uh, building block of you know, for all um, antitrust states, especially those coming up. Uh, so I just yeah, wanted to add a few thoughts on, on, on that. And and if we are saying dominance is an issue, well, if, if it's anti-competitive, um, Google may be dominant in an Android market. Um, yes. Is, is it in the smartphone market? If you include Apple, maybe not. So you could argue also Google and Facebook are competing with each other uh, and with television when it comes to add uh, revenue. So I think there are a few points to, to be made here. And one last thing, I think we're, we're saying, uh, we're saying uh, to get back to my point about the importance of data as potentially a, a signal or a, an instrument of market power. Think about when Google entered uh, uh, the market when Yahoo and Alta Vista were, were very well established and you know they had large basis of users, but what Google did was to use the, the data available in a better way and to figure out the right strategy in search, which wasn't obvious at the time. Uh, it, it, it was not a long index of all pages classified by themes that they went for, but they decided to offer a page rank algorithm. Sometimes it's really the expertise rather than the data itself that can really provide you that competitive edge. Um, so I'll just stop here now too dominate the conversation either. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for the follow-up. Um, I, I just want to touch up, touch upon very quickly um, on something which a couple of, of you uh, actually mentioned throughout the discussion, the nuclear option, the breaking up option. Um, recently, there was a position paper signed by France and the Netherlands uh, calling for decisive action against online gatekeepers, arguing that um, structural separation or the breakup of these companies should be on the table when we talk about competition law. Now, there's, there's divisions in the commission itself on this, on this issue, allegedly between Commissioner Breton and Commissioner Vestager, but this is a question to all three of you panelists. Where do you stand on the breakup option, the nuclear option? Is this, should this be on the table? Clue, yeah. <laughs> Hard to be on the table. I, I, I'm not convinced that it should. I think we we've a lot of a uh, long way to go before we any, we need to we need to see evidence. And um, personally, I, I I don't think we we, we need to, to we're not we're not at that point, and we need to define we need to define things like what what we mean, what is dominance, and and as Aline has just said, is it based on um, is it based on expertise or your data? I don't think we have those answers, and don't we have that information? So I think we tread. Uh, move very carefully and cautiously. And, we, you know, it, and, and again, I go back to the point I made at the beginning. Dominance is not, if there is dominance. <laughs> at one point, I'm saying we need to define it. But if there is, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if it offers consumers a good service and, and options in whatever domain, but um, it's in the abuse of the dominance is, is the issue rather than dominance. So I think um, we need to really tread cautiously on that one. I'm not convinced myself. Okay, tread, tread lightly. This is your advice, okay? Uh, Eileen or Hossop, do you want to jump on on this? But just briefly, um, um, thanks for giving me the word again. I, I think it's, I mean, you should use competition policy for retaliation and a political agenda. And even Executive Vice President uh, Vestager said this is, you know, this would, this would be something quite radical, but there, I don't, I don't think that she's thinking about it. Um, you know, and when they try to do it, um, it didn't always work. I think for at and that, you know, another monopoly uh, emerged in the end. I don't recall the name, but um, so I think the way we should be thinking, uh, you know, there's one way to think about this is conduct remedies and the other one is structural remedy. Conduct remedies have been historically the way in which regulators have approached this, for instance, with the Microsoft case, the way it was using its power over Office and Windows against competitors, and Microsoft fixed it. 
uh, structural remedy would have been to break up Microsoft somehow. And this is the last resort that's been used for at and uh, but NITRUST authorities have not embraced that until, until rather recently. Um, so, and also just one last remark, uh, if you break them up, I mean, are they going to be better at tackling issues we see online? Uh, we see how it is really difficult when addressing just, you know, a few actors to get them involved into a code of conduct. You can't control the rest of them. Uh, you can't subject them to similar uh, control. So this is very delicate to imagine that it would be better if you had uh, multiple Facebook. And also think, I mean, maybe this is a bit of a side note, but uh, you'd have Facebook and Headbook split, you know, Facebook. So uh, is that going to be convenient for me as a as the user? Also, if you have an Amazon page with Amazon products and then multiple pages for all the other providers, all the other business users. Also, can I short comment on the breakup option? Well, I think it's a bit of a red herring. Uh, I'm wondering if that option is put out there just to, you know, destabilize it, denormalize the debate and just to show, you know, it's, it's a classic trick of lobbying where, you know, you put an extreme option on the table in order to push the needle as far as you can go towards the direction. I don't think it's realistic. And, uh, and just the fact that we are talking about it shows that, you know, uh, ex ante approach that doesn't work. I mean, if anything, ex ante actually creates market failures. And the people who couldn't actually predict how the desktop computing and music industry would develop 10 years ago should probably not have the power to actually break up companies unless we see direct harm that is basically unsuccum uh, which cannot be remedied through any other means. So I'm with Aline on that point. Uh, also, a very quick follow-up because right now we, we just had a question on our live stream and I think it's directed to you. So maybe 30 seconds. Um, would you consider that potentially killing democracy could be an argument for life or death type of ex ante? I think he was referring, to the, 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 the guest is referring to your, your question you posed about the severity of the situation. So killing democracy, is this what at stake? Question to you. Well, I don't think giving people a voice on social media, for example, if that's one of the concerns, is killing democracy. I think it's strengthening the democracy. The problem is that the established voices like us in this room cannot win against very nasty opinions out there because it turns out that once we let go of the, the opinion monopoly, we actually tend to lose debates to people who don't share the values of, let's say, an honorable organization like EPP. That's a completely different problem. Uh, who kills democracies? Tanks? Autarchs? How about this information okay. online? Yeah, of course. And we have very good means of dealing with it. That is that's called intermediary liability. Uh, we have also means of actually stressing that through uh, libel law and uh, the problem is uh, is a completely different kind which is that we don't know who puts out these nasty opinions because people are anonymous online and to the further extent that we want we would like to we would like to actually safeguard that so let's look at the ownership concentration for example in traditional media and that has not been great for the diversity of debate I can't be on television tonight just because I want to and put my opinion across. That's real dominance. Um, we have uh, another question. But just to, well, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. I mean, you, you raised that, you raised that earlier. It's just a question that struck me. Um, we do have various media outlets that allow different voices. So um, we don't have one. We, well, I suppose we, we have competition law again in the media to try to, to control dominance. I think it's, um, and, and you know, depending on your views, I'm sure that I you know in where I where I come from, there's always a media obliged to to give both sides of an argument, all the times. So, when well, certainly the broadcast media. We we have a question on our Facebook page, and I'll I'll also like to bundle it with with uh, another question of of, of mine. It's, it's, this is open to all three three panelists, so feel free to, to jump in. 
Um, Hendrik asks, since the digital services sector and especially the social media platforms are extremely global, how important is it for the DMA to align with other non-European uh, regulations? Um, I mean, that's a big question, but also I want to add in my, my, uh, my take here. How closely do you think the Americans are going to be following the DMA? Um, the Department of Justice in the States recently started another investigation on a big tech company. Um, there's been numerous reports from U.S. authorities about gatekeepers online, about potential monopolies online. So do you think the debate in Europe is going to also shift legislation and concepts with the new Biden administration? Open question for the panel. If I, well, if I may, um, well, we yeah. don't know, but I suppose Europeans, particularly when we, we spoke about GDPR earlier on, um, you know, we went ahead with the data protection regulation without any um, US or another, any about it being available in any other jurisdiction. So I think uh, Europeans will, uh, are the commission and will certainly look to do their own thing in, in this in this area. And I see and I hear and I'm reading uh, reports from the US um, and um, I know there was strong calls from an antitrust point of view so we'll just see how that goes but I think at, at the, you know I think we're determined to do do it uh, uh, the European way um, albeit having con conscious that um, and, and that's probably what's behind this from reading about it behind this proposed DMA is to ensure that European companies can flourish I think it's a sh it's I mean I have I have really have no um, acts to grind against any large large companies. I think the services that our platform operators are, are very valuable and consumers flock to them. And I wonder if many of the consumers out there, the 450 million European consumers, if we knew we were having this debate about um, maybe potentially breaking up large platforms, would they be too pleased? I think that's something that maybe, I don't, I don't think that they would be. But, you know, I think this is about support, ensuring that European businesses can flourish well. At the same time, we need to balance it and need to have a fair, a fair approach to the whole thing. Thanks. Uh, Hosok, I think you raised your hand just now. Uh, well, um, I think we need to bear in mind two things. One, when it comes to U.S. approaches. And frankly, as Europeans, what happens in the U.S. is not really my concern. <laughs> But yes, there has been uh, antitrust investigation in the U.S. by the Trump administration. Let's see where Biden administration goes. That's, I mean, there there is a certain element of, I may be called that I'm wrong on this by Democrats or Republicans or Trumpists, but there seems to be a certain element of personal vendetta going on against um, tech companies who are usually seen in the U.S. as left-leaning. Uh, so that's the first. Uh, the second is we point exactly to the question that we are discussing here. They are not necessarily looking in the U.S. Uh, to address dominance through uh, let's go after all the companies that are named after major South American rivers law. They are not singling out a sector. They're actually using antitrust instruments. That's exposed. Yes, there are talks about updating section 230 and in terms of intermediate liability and so forth. But that's pretty horizontal way of looking at things. And, you know, that connects back to what we're discussing about uh, the democracy and intermediate liability. But generally, there is a difference in approach. Uh, Either you wait until there is a market failure and said you have to correct these wrongs, and the other approach is going ex ante. Just because you use a particular channel, we are going to assume that you are in the wrong, and we are going to prevent you from doing certain things that you shouldn't do. We tried that approach in telecoms. We have assumed that all telecom operators were dominant. Turns out that they were not. comment on that? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I just wanted to maybe briefly react on what I can react to, which is uh, maybe the U.S. agenda. So I know there are some efforts uh, from the Commission side and 
potentially the new administration to maybe not coordinate, but at least discuss those issues together. Uh, I think the more we go into a fragmented framework for the online environment, the less efficient that will be. So I'm, I'm hoping, of course, that there will be more discussions at that level um, on what Biden thinks. Um, well, I know he said that online platforms should do more to, to prevent the spread of, of misinformation and, and, and hate speech. Uh, in, an, in an interview, he called um, for rescinding the um, uh, Section 230 liability protections. Uh, so he thinks that um, they should be revoked. But I don't, I don't necessarily expect that it will be the case. Um, there might be bigger fish to fry as well. Um, and the, the campaign of Biden um, it did circulate a petition calling on Facebook to remove false uh, content, uh, content uh, um, and um, and such. So I think there is yeah, there is going to be um, maybe a tighter grip on on online platforms, but. Um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what, what happens. And on the other point, I think um, there was about the, how you know what's going to happen if you have a set of rules in Europe. How will will there be alignment in general with other jurisdictions? I think what the EU should keep in mind is. Um, so generally enforcing one country's restrictions on, on online content that's generated outside of, of a particular country will lead to infringement of freedom of, speech, of freedom of speech and might limit access to information. And within the EU itself already, you have some member states that criminalize certain types of speech while others do not. Um, I mean, you, you might have this example of, you know, abortion also in the law being, being forbidden in Poland, uh, maybe criticizing the king in a country is forbidden. So there should be, I think, for the DSA, if we're talking about the DSA itself, the, this update to the regime should really respect the, the global nature of the internet and avoid, you know, cross-border conflicts, which would, which could occur between jurisdictions that have tight speech standards and those which operate according to different standards. So it shouldn't impose one platform to remove content globally based on another platform's or another national um, jurisdiction standard, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. We, we have only a couple of minutes left, so I want to close with, a, again, a question to all three panelists, because here we, we talk about regulation, we talk about ex ante, about new rules, this is fine, and, and of course this is part of, potentially part of the Commission's new approach, but how can we actually make Europe more competitive in the digital realm? Of course, regulation potentially can do its part, but there should be other other pillars and other streams we have to we have to um, identify. Is it the digital market? Is it empowering SMEs? What do you think? How can we actually make Europe better at digital in the next decade? I'll start. Go ahead. Um, how can we make it better? Um, I certainly don't think eliminating competition and breaking up uh, uh, com companies for, from, from other jurisdictions is, is the way to do it. But I just think creating an environment whereby SMEs can flourish. I think in our, I don't think we have a history of, um, in our education system, uh, I think that, that, that will be important. But I certainly think we need to create the, the environment where, um, um, where, uh, where SMEs can flourish and investing more, maybe unicorn capital, that type of thing. To look look at that area, do we want we want our unicorns? That's what we what we do want. But I think and I think we just need to try not try, but to create that um, that environment. And our, our, there is talk of a, a new industrial strategy for Europe, and I think that should be part of it. Thanks, Eileen. Well, thank you. Um, and thanks again uh, once more for having me. Um, I think the EU may have other priorities to address because it's missing the key ingredients to to compete in the digital economy. You know, you want to have that large consumer domestic market, which is declared in theory, but only you know it's still fragmented. Uh, you have diverging IP laws, uh, etc. So, and I think what we're seeing risks leading to decisions based on perception. So. There might be discriminatory mechanisms in place. Um, and I think regulators, though they have noble intentions, sometimes they may be unable to know ahead of time how far innovation can go or will go. But what they can do is maybe to create a, a framework that doesn't pick uh, 
winners and, and, and losers. Uh, I think it has become convenient to pull out antitrust laws uh, in response to every tech issue, for instance. But it hasn't made the EU more innovation friendly or more mindful of actual consumer need. Um, so, um, yeah, thanks again. Thanks, Celine. Also, closing thoughts? Well, uh, I'll tell you what won't work. Uh, we won't become more productive by slowing down the productive of everyone else. That's not an approach that works. So this is, I think, the reason why I think people are so aghast outside of Europe. They couldn't believe that the Europeans could go this far in just trying to get, yeah, I mean, just, uh, just by addressing our inadequacy, just by imposing regulations that discriminate others. And this is the fundamental problem what we are discussing here. Dimitar, you challenged some of the numbers about GDPR, and uh, here, here's the thing. Productivity is not a tax that you pay. You don't see the money going out of it. These losses that we are talking about, they were there. Uh, the only reason you don't see it, because rather than making 100 euros, you're only making 99.5. You don't see the difference. But over a long term, over 10 years and 15 years, you will see that because you'll suddenly find that, hold on a second, what happened to those European innovations? And I can prove that because you only have to go 15, 20 years back in time just to see that the industrial planning in Europe made some horrible, horrible calls that actually cost us the competitiveness. It's not because the other people were cheating. It was because we were looking the other way. We stuck to the approach of increasing basically supply and supply as much as possible. Deidre was saying herself, we don't have any problems with dominance as long as it's big factories. Tell you what, the future was not in aggregating supply, it's in demand. It's in actually in the power of the consumers and the users. And the more demand you can aggregate, the more successful you are. And so in other words, we laugh about some of the policies that we did 20, 25 years ago. Tariffs some videotapes from Japan that could only be custom cleared on the mountaintop in France. You know, you can Google for it or whatever your favorite search engine is. We did some really ridiculous stuff 25 years ago. Actually, it's more than that now. But you know what? 10 years down the line, people are going to laugh at us and say, wow, we could sidestep our own values and our principles this far. We actually went that far. And the funny thing is, not Americans, but the East Asians and you know people in nearby regions are already laughing at us now. With a liberal of tremble, it could be us next. And that's not really, that's the main reason I'm saying that ex ante and this kind of approach that we are trying to invent and justify ourselves, that's not the Europe I signed up for. That's a, that's a bold statement by Hossok. He's, he's upping the ante in the end. Um, and I, I see this as a provocation so that we can invite him for our next debate on the actual implementation of the Digital Markets Act. And when the whole thing is, is more clear, when it goes through parliament, I, I'm sure this is going to take a couple of years. So I'm sure we'll be having a lot of debates in the next couple of months and I, I guess years. So uh, we're running out of time. I really want to thank all panelists for, for joining in. This is a very complex topic. Uh, thank you for guiding our audience and viewers through it. So, uh, dear viewers, stay tuned for uh, next uh, Martin Center webinars, and I wish you a fine day. Thank you. Thank you so Goodbye much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye.